Hi, folks. That was an excellent panel, wasn't it? On manufacturing, I've rarely seen one so good. So congratulations to the panelists and the organizers, uh, all of us, including Andy and Amanda Novello, who's our policy associate. In the 1970s, a couple of guys with reputations spread fairy dust across the land. Uh, I think of Milton Friedman and Ronald Reagan. Their fairy dust was contagious. It wasn't only contagious about, um, uh, with the right wing, it was contagious with Democrats as well. And the essence of that fairy dust was, forget about government. Government is the problem. We've got to give business their head and we will solve our problems. Uh, sometimes they say that explicitly, sometimes not, but what I want to stress is the democratic economists to some degree bought into that. That's why I started rediscovering government. Re government has been battered, not merely by right-wing ideologues, but by many in the middle and by neglect among the left. And we had to restore the, our faith in the uses of government and what it could do. What we got as a consequence of the fairy dust was this horrid wage situation we are now in. As EPI calls it in the paper you all should read, which we've done, they've done for this project, it's been a long-term wage crisis. We've by and large had stagnating wages for most Americans in the income spectrum for 40 years. Now I should qualify that technically a little bit, but I'm not going to bother. It gets <laughs> the essence across. Yet we haven't noticed. Why haven't we noticed? I always argue, I sometimes argue, I should say, that one reason we don't notice is we were the highest wage nation in the world since colonial days. Since colonial days. Higher wages than anything comparable in the old world when we were developing. That changed essentially 30 or 40 years ago with a couple of minor exceptions earlier in our history. It changed, I argue, because of the misunderstanding of the role of government in making economies work fairly and indeed of uh, uh, creating value and supporting economic growth. One example quickly of how accustomed we become to a low wage society and how little in anger it incurred is yesterday's uh, announcement of median family incomes. Median family incomes finally topped the 1999 level. And what I read, though there were qualifications in some pieces later, what I read was my median family income is now higher than its record in 1999. Think about that. You probably don't have to think about that. You know what I'm leading to. What that means is median family incomes haven't risen for 20 years. People are making the same, they did in, same money they did in 1999 and so much has changed. More to the point, wages always increased over 20-year periods in America. And that's really what the American dream has been about. It hasn't been about making a fortune. It's about constantly doing better, and indeed doing better than your parents did, and having more control of your lives and a somewhat happier place in the world. That ended, and we hardly noticed. Uh, it's hard for us, I think, collectively to shake off this sense of our uniqueness. Uh, the example I cite about the median wages is a pretty good one. But in fact, median wages have stagnated for virtually all income levels except the very top. Uh, the Amer American poverty rate, though down substantially due to effective social policies, if measured correctly from the 1960s, is still, even if we measure it correctly, among the highest in the rich world. Child poverty, most tragically, is the highest. Child poverty rate is the highest in the advanced world. How do we tolerate things like this? This poor economic performance has reshaped our nation. It's contributed to middle class bitterness, which has been alluded to. Uh, and it has resulted, I think, in a dispirited electorate now, I loved Senator Gillibrand's remarks. I think they're right on, and I think she could lead us to a far better world. But forgive me if I offend anybody here. Where were the darn Democrats before that? 
why didn't they realize they were still living with all this fairy dust? Why didn't they shake it off? I don't think I have to go to, through too many specifics about how poorly we're doing. Amanda uh, Novello and I did a little comparison internationally to help put things in pers perspective. The bottom 40% of Americans have a lower share of income than uh, other European, uh, than other rich nations. Once I get a reading a text, I'm in big trouble, so I'm sure you'll forgive me. The American GDP rose about as rapidly since uh, the last recession, the big recession, than other nations, but wages rose more rapidly on average in these other nations. A couple of specific points, and I'm going to stop. 41 or 42 million workers earn less than $12 an hour. That would put them at the, po if they were the sole earner in a family of four, that would put them at a poverty line, the official poverty measure. And I must say, I'm popping here, the official poverty measure is such an antiquated, such an antiquated misleading measure that it doesn't nearly tell us how bad off the poor are. Just one other point about the service sector. I just pulled this out of the air. Home health aides in the United States average earnings of $23,130. This very important aspect of our economy is these people are hardly paid. They're, they're basically paid poverty wages. How do we go on from there? We dealt with manufacturing, I think, very effectively. It's a key part of the situation right now and the difficulties right now. America grew into a middle class nation based on manufacturing. As some of the participants said already, it won't be the lifesaver, but it can certainly uh, help the process along to a higher wage society. Now we've got to think about measures that uh, raise the services sector and related occupations into the real world that make work pay, that, in the words of Senator Gillibrand, reward work again. And that's what this next panel is about. We're going to continue this effort at Rediscovering Government, the Rediscovering Government Initiative in association with the Century Foundation. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. We've done quite a few conferences in Washington over the years. This is a particularly exciting one. So let me throw this to the new panel who know, know something or two about this issue, and I think it'll be quite fruitful for you all. Thank you again, and thank you to all my colleagues. I think they've already been thanked. to be moderating this panel today, not only because I think this is literally one of the most pressing economic issues of our time. We obviously have many political and social issues which are also incredibly pressing, but most economists would agree that as far as economic issues go, this is uh, one of the most pressing issues. So the other reason why I'm excited to be uh, moderating this panel is because we have really an incredible group of panelists here people who are very knowledgeable about the issues that, that were just raised. Um, and we're going to be talking about how can America be a high wage society. So let me start by introducing our panelists. So to my right, we have Eileen Applebaum. Eileen is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, or CIPR. Um, before coming to CIPR, Eileen was a distinguished professor and director of the Center of Women and Work at Rutgers University. Um, Eileen opened the ground for the rest of us who went to do PhDs later in economics. She actually pursued her economics at the University of Pennsylvania before there were too many women in the profession. And things haven't changed that much, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. but, but certainly you opened the ground for the rest of us. Uh, Eileen continues to be incredibly active. She just recently published a book 
uh, called Private Equity at Work, which uh, actually won a prize as one of the best books in 2015. And uh, Eileen continues to be incredibly productive. So to Eileen's right is Josh Bivens. So Josh, uh, many of you probably know him. He's director of research at the Economic Policy Institute. And uh, Josh has been very active in working on macroeconomics, inequality, and the economics of globalization. Josh has just published uh, two books also recently. One very timely uh, entitled Everybody Wins Except for Most of Us, What Economics <laughs> Teaches About Globalization. So he can tell us certainly a lot about what we're living today. And The State of Work in America, another very timely um, book to, to be looking at. So uh, we're excited to have uh, Josh here today. Josh uh, got his PhD from the new school and his BA from the University of Maryland. And he was also assistant professor in, in the Roosevelt University of Chicago. So we have a very nice group of people who have worked both in academia as well as the policy world. I'm very happy to be introducing next uh, Bill Spriggs, my good old friend and colleague from the Department of Labor. So Bill right now is the chief economist for the <coughs> AFL-CIO as well as professor at Howard University, <coughs> where before that he was the chair of the economics department. And um, as I just mentioned, Bill importantly was um, the assistant secretary for economic policy at the Department of Labor under the Obama administration. And that's where Bill and I closely worked together when I was the chief economist there. Um, Bill is um, very active um, in his role at the AFL-CIO. In, in, in fact, he actually chairs the Trade Union Advisory Committee for the OECD, and he's been very active over the years with many organizations, including API, um, and we're very happy to have him here. And last but not least, uh, we have Sanjukta Hall to the right. And Sanjukta is an assistant professor at the law school at Wayne State University. So Sanjukta also has worked in the policy world as well as in academics. Um, she has a forthcoming book on solidarity in the shadow of antitrust, which is gonna be published by Cambridge University Press. Um, she, has been, she has been a clerk for George Alfred Goodwin in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and before that, she was an Epstein Fellow at UCLA. So she has a long academic career as well as a lot of work that she's done in the policy world. So uh, without further ado, let me talk a little bit, continue on some of the remarks that were made and introduce this topic, which probably doesn't need introduction in this audience, but, but nonetheless put it in context and then I'll ask, dive into questions for each of you. So as, as I mentioned before, this issue of rising inequality, rising income inequality, uh, really is the most troubling issue, economic issue of our time. Income inequality has been increasing since the 1970s uh, after going through a period go known as the Great Compression for all the way from the 30s to the 70s when we saw actually inequality <laughs> shrink. But after that, in the 1970s, we've seen inequality continue to rise and continue to hurt many Americans. So. The very troubling thing is that very recent data that we have um, an analysis that has been done by Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Saez actually shows us that much of this increase in inequality is really driven by huge gains for those at the very, very top and losses for the middle class. Um, so some of the data that was mentioned before, if you look at the gains, for example, for those at the very top, in the top 1% of the distribution, it's very startling. You have that, that group, those in the top 1% of the income distribution used to get 10% of all income in the economy, now they get 20%. And by contrast, the low half of the income distribution, so the lowest 50% of the income distribution, used to get about 20% before in the late 1970s, and now they're getting about 12%. So the situation has completely reversed. So this is very troubling because it points to the fact 
that that middle class that used to have a much more stable source of income have hopes again to improve their situation into the future for their families to improve and to have mobility into the future are seeing a situation where they're they're not able to move forward much of that has happened because the biggest source of income for those middle class families is really income from labor and the wages and the wage stagnation that we've been seeing has been going on for many decades now so it's been basically only two three years since we've seen some growth in wage uh, in wages so wage growth has has been ex <laughs> going up uh, probably since 2015 um, but before that we, we really didn't see very much growth in fact wages were completely stagnant during that period and that's what a lot of what we're going to be talking about is is going to be focusing on so one of the things that we saw is that the growth in wages that has happened in the past few years thanks to the very vibrant recovery after the Great Recession, is that that growth in income has come because new people are working, new family members are entering the labor force, or people are working longer hours. Um, unfortunately, there is much less evidence that this wage growth is happening because people who already have jobs are earning more, or because these new jobs are actually better and pay more than previous jobs that were existent before. So I wanna ask Josh, I wanna start by asking Josh um, about how this concept and this idea that we're reaching full employment um, can, it, can explain why we're seeing this wage growth. So I want you to, to explain this concept of full employment, explain if we have reached full employment and also link that to the necessity of having full employment to actually generate wage pressures to, to move forward in this direction. And following that, I want you to comment a little bit on monetary and fiscal policies, and in particular, the role that the Federal Reserve Bank can play in encouraging this full employment, which in turn, we hope is gonna generate wage growth. So I'm gonna pass the mic to you. Okay, actually mine seems to be working okay. Is can people hear? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you to the organizers of the conference and everyone here. Um, oh, I just went away, didn't I? Um, <laughs> but we'll try. So when economists tend to talk about full employment, what we basically mean is that no employment ex unemployment exists because demand for spending from households, businesses, and government is too low to soak up all available workers. What we're really talking about is doing away with all unemployment that happens simply because spending is too low. You can have a period of time where nationally there's enough spending being demanded by people to soak up all available workers, but something is in the way of the jobs and the workers. We call that structural unemployment. Maybe the jobs are in the suburbs, the workers are in the central city, and transportation is lousy, so there's a structural impediment. But what we really want to make sure, the low-hanging fruit to make sure the economy is operating correctly, is to make sure simply that there's enough spending, so that there's enough demand for jobs that we can soak up every potential worker in the economy. And I think it's really important to do this for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's easy. It's really easy to make sure there's enough spending in the economy to soak up all available workers. If households and businesses aren't up to the task, have government spend. We have tons of unmet social needs that could benefit from public investment, whether it's infrastructure, early childhood education, there's many public needs. Have government spend the money if households and businesses are not spending enough to soak up all available workers. Two, it's important because it's not just cheap, it's better than free. Unemployment is pure waste. It is a potentially productive person who cannot be doing anything productive simply because macroeconomic spending is not high enough. When you move someone from unemployment to actually having a job and producing something, that's not just free from a social perspective, that's, that's better than free. You're actually creating income. So it's just pure waste to allow that kind of unemployment that occurs because of a demand shortfall to happen. I think third and most on point with what we're here about today, it's just really hard for low and moderate wage workers to gain any leverage at all to get wage increases when the labor market is really soft because there's not enough spending going on. Like if you think about it, we all have implicit bargains that we're always striking with our employer and the, the big threat we have as workers when we don't think our wages are high enough is we'll quit and we'll find a better job somewhere else. 
that's a really not credible threat if the unemployment rate is eight or even seven or even six percent. For some workers, it's not even a credible threat when the unemployment rate is four percent. Um, we want labor markets tight enough. We want so much job creation, so much spending going on, that really does become a credible threat for almost all workers. Um, and so full employment means employers should really be begging for workers rather than workers begging for jobs. And this is particularly important for low and moderate wage workers. You know, CEOs don't really have to worry about super tight labor markets. They've got a whole different set of dynamics for really privileged workers. They don't need the labor market to be white hot all the time to get some leverage. <clears throat> for the vast majority of workers, we really do need very tight labor markets. Um, and I would say as well, this leads us to the definition of full employment. We, there's a lot of talk these days that we've had the unemployment rates sit around 4%, give or take, for about a year. People said, that's low in historic terms. We must be at full employment. The definition of full employment is low and moderate wage workers actually get raises. We are not in full employment until that happens. If that's not happening, we should push unemployment lower because that means we are not at full employment yet. So finally, I'll just say one last bit, that it's, it's mostly this part where it's low and moderate wage workers basically the bottom 80 percent who really need tight labor markets to get wage increases that explains why we strangely need kind of a political movement to get full employment i, I said earlier economically it's pure waste to not have it that it's easy to get and so that leads to the question of well why don't we sit at full employment all the time why is this not just the highest priority of policymakers it's not the highest priority because there is a distributional angle to it it is Less than full employment is terrible for low and moderate wage workers because basically it saps their leverage because there's not enough competition for them in the labor market. But those soft labor markets that suppress the wages of the bottom 80% are quite good for corporate managers and the effect in restraining inflation is quite good for finance. And so you've got a distributional decision on the part of policymakers. Do I generate really tight labor markets that benefit the bottom 80%? Or do I let them sit a little soft and make corporate managers and finance happy? And we know how that sort of distributional conflict tends to play out in American politics. And so I'll just wrap up with, I think even though it's economically easy to figure out what to do to generate full employment, it is politics that sits in the way. And that's even true of the Federal Reserve. The Federal <laughs> Reserve is not, it tries to be a purely technocratic body, it's not. I mean, basically five of 12 votes on the Federal Open Market Committee come from regional Federal Reserve banks around the country. Those regional banks have as their boards of directors representatives from finance and big business who choose their presidents. And so we really need to realize just to get good, efficient economics that full employment sort of signifies, you actually need a political movement and political change to make that happen. Thanks so much. Thank you, Josh, for talking about uh, the impacts of monetary and fiscal policy on wage growth. I want to go and dive now much more into the functioning of the labor market and how the functioning of the labor market itself, and so I'm going to talk about um, the growth of independent contractors, and I want to talk about anti-competitive policies, and I want to talk about unions with Bill, and about how those affect wage growth. So I'm going to ask Eileen to comment on this uh, phenomena of fissuring, which we've all heard about. So this growth of different labor relations and work relations that have evolved in the labor market. I want you to, since you're an expert, to explain to us what this concept of fissuring in the labor market actually means, what different forms it takes, and how it affects wage growth in the economy. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, well, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone uh, who has uh, taken time to come and listen to us. So if you go back and look at the 20th century, you see that for most of the 20th century, uh, we had the, the economy was dominated by large, vertically integrated firms that produced uh, in their subsidiaries and their divisions all of the stages of the production process, had many uh, other kinds of activities, uh, ancillary activities, cafeterias, uh, the workers were on the payroll of the big company, uh, maintenance, housekeeping. Uh, later, uh, we had uh, things like uh, human resource management, information technology. Uh, all of these things were done by workers who worked for that large company. And the reason economists give for that is that the costs of monitoring your workforce at that time were lower than the costs of monitoring contract companies, suppliers, vendors. But technology has changed all of that. 
Uh, it is now uh, possible for a company to monitor uh, the business-to-business -business contracts uh, that it engages in. Uh, and so uh, we had a situation then uh, starting about 50 years ago at about the same time <laughs> as uh, all of the uh, other things that happened that uh, have uh, led to uh, driving down wages and uh, increasing inequality. Uh, we had the disassembling of these large companies. Uh, what they did is that they, uh, they began to see that they could contract out for various parts of the production process. And so the first things to go, of course, were the cafeteria and the housekeeping and the maintenance. Uh, and then even specialized services like IT, human resource management, payroll, these became uh, outsourced. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, they began to outsource even things that you might have thought of as their uh, core competencies. And so what we ended up with is a situation in which uh, many workers work for contract companies. And I do want to say that this is not, we're not here talking about independent contractors. Some of those contract companies may hire independent contractors, they may hire temporary workers, but many, many of the workers who are in the situation are working for a contract company that depends on this dominant <laughs> firm, which kept the core competencies, right? The dominant firm says, I keep the core competencies, I contract for everything else. And so we don't catch them in the data because they are in standard employment relations. And I would argue that it's not the rise of non-standard work. That has a share of employment that has not actually risen, despite all you hear about the gig economy. It has not actually risen. In my view, what has increased is the number of companies that depend on contracts with these dominant firms. Uh, and the dominant, it can't be two minutes, I have to only talk for one. <laughs> Uh, the dominant firms uh, are able to exercise a lot of power in setting those contracts. You have tremendous competition uh, among the uh, laundry companies at hospitals, that launder the things at hospitals, among the many different kinds of suppliers uh, to various big businesses compete with each other for these contracts. The contracts often go to the lowest bidder. And how does the lowest bidder manage to be the lowest bidder? Since their main costs are often labor costs, it is by suppressing wages. And in fact, these companies themselves are operating on rather narrow margins. You really cannot expect them to be able to raise wages. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible if they are, are in this kind of a, of a relationship. So you, you have a production ecosystem that in, uh, in, includes many small producers or many small service companies, all of them dependent on getting contracts with this dominant firm. And so the dominant firm then sets the conditions, the parameters of those contracts. <coughs> this is, we, we know that when you have dominant firms and they consolidate, we've seen the mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we, we see consolidation among dominant firms at the same time as we see the fragmentation of the delivery of services, business to business services, completely fragmented. Uh, and so uh, in this situation, uh, you, you, uh, the, the dominant firms are able to extract much of the uh, value added, much of the profit, much of the rent that the entire production ecosystem uh, produces. Uh, so there are a couple of consequences of this. One is in those parameters that they set, one of the outcomes of that are the low wages that get paid. We know that when you have dominant firms, they can set prices, we know about monopoly. They also, through these uh, contracts, affect the wages of many workers, and this is referred to as monopsony when you have the ability of some firms to actually hold down wages uh, in a labor market. Uh, and so you end up with a situation in which the dominant firm is core employees, the firm is extracting the rents and the profits. It may share some of those with its core employees. It wants to hold on to them, it wants to retain them. These workers are not in competition with the labor market for their jobs or for their wages. Uh, and then you have other companies uh, which are reliant on contracts whose workers are paid much less. Uh, and so uh, what you see, one of the things that you see out of this is that workers with similar skills, education, potential productivity, demographic characteristics are paid different wages in different establishments. And some of them are paid much higher wages. Usually they're uh, employed by the dominant companies. 
and others are paid much lower wages. Usually they are in the contract companies. Uh, and so you see rising wage inequality. A big part of the increase in inequality is among workers with similar productivity and demographic characteristics employed in different establishments. And so this is what has happened. This, this uh, growth of dominant firms and a, a production ecosystem that depends on these contracts uh, has led to a very different way that labor markets are organized and that wages are determined. So I see I'm out of time, I will stop here. Uh, there's a longer version of my remarks on the CEPR website. So if you want to really see what I'm talking about, you, you're welcome to go there. Thank you, Eileen, and we'll have a chance to go back to you as well, so we definitely have uh, more time. But this leads your remarks, and also Josh's remarks actually lead very nicely into what I wanted to ask Sanjukta. So um, very recent work has shown these, how this increased market power hurts workers, and market power, increased market power by businesses ends up really hurting workers. So in the way you pointed out, right, monopsony power depresses wages for workers. It takes away any bargaining power for workers. Josh pointed out also the idea that collusion among firms and the inability to move between jobs, um, sometimes because of these uh, non-compete covenants or non-poaching agreements that are included in worker contracts, right, tends to inhibit also mobility and tends to reduce wages as well, or at least uh, stagnate wages. Um, so those are very important. But Sanjukta has done very interesting work uh, on antitrust law and how antitrust law also can inhibit the ability for workers to organize. So I wanted you to talk a little bit in particular about how antitrust enforcement itself poses problems for American workers and how this operates to keep wages down. Thank, thank you, and thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. Can you hear me? Okay, okay now can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so as the sole lawyer on a panel of economists, I actually want to start uh, by suggesting that part of the reason we have poor wages today is uh, not just for economic reasons, but for the because of the law's misuse of certain economic concepts. So I want to start from the premise that the selective use of the of the concept of economic competition, and uh, particularly the selective deployment of that concept against workers, is and has been central to policy making deliberation in this country for a few decades now, as we heard, coinciding with some of these other changes, and that overall this has impeded the policy project of winning uh, higher wages or sustainable, even sustaining what we had. And we've just heard a little bit about how our understanding of that concept of economic competition has evolved with new research in economics, showing that labor markets are perhaps structurally monopsonistic, that employers have power to set wages and this should clearly impact labor market policy. I want to suggest to you, though, that in addition to that very important point and its implications for policy from living wage laws to collective bargaining, there is a basic flaw in the deployment of the idea of competition at the intersection of labor and competition law, which is where I work, and radiating out from there, perhaps more importantly, into policy making deliberation generally. And that flaw, I will take ownership, comes from the law, I think, rather than from economics. Let's begin by noticing that the boundaries of the business firm, the changes in which we've just been talking about, insulate many instances of economic coordination that would otherwise be deemed anti-competitive if they were to take place between firms or individual biological persons in the market. This is especially, especially noticeable in the service sectors that increasingly dominate our economy. The regulatory discrepancies that flow from this fact tend to entrench existing distributions of advantage, power, and opportunity rather than to balance it. The basic point is this. Economic life necessarily involves competition and coordination. It always has, although our policy choices about how to allocate coordination rights can change, and they have changed quite a bit. 
Presently, both antitrust law and I would say our dominant frame for economic policy deliberation more generally tend to favor top-down hierarchical forms of coordination grounded in ownership rights, that's a legal concept, Rob, while viewing more democratic and horizontal forms of coordination with skepticism. And you see that play out with how antitrust treats gig economy workers and freelancers in particular, but it extends beyond that. So the research I've been doing suggests that this deep-seated preference in the law, which actually precedes the contemporary concern with promoting competition as a matter of economic policy, can be traced back before the New Deal, for uh, back to antitrust and the laws, original preference for protecting property rights over workers' freedom of association and contract, and indeed um, for protecting coordination based on property rights over coordination based on labor. Um, and the labor movement knows this well as the period known as government by injunction when warehouse workers, railroad workers, um, coal miner strikes for decent wages were broken often very violently with the full power of the state behind it. But what's interesting about this phase of the law for us now is that at the time the courts were very open about protecting coordination rights based on ownership rather than labor. The New Deal of course changed that, but the New Deal compact has cognized coordination among working people fundamentally as an exception to a dominant principle about promoting competition. And that's a change from the previous dominant legal philosophy of promoting freedom of contract, which was inconsistently applied to workers and to business owners. But once again, the deeper tendency in the law has remained the same, which is to allocate those coordination rights on the basis of ownership, now largely through the form of the business firm and protecting things like vertical restraints while horizontal coordination is not protected, which allows fissuring to allow for the lead firms to retain control while d disclaiming uh, responsibility. And again, um, I'll just say that some allocation of coordination rights in the economy is necessary. That's because promoting competition as a driver for economic policy is simply too broad. It requires its own limitation. And at the same time, it fails to supply us with decision criteria to actually decide between the limitations upon it. And as a result, I would argue that what the law has done but, uh, in large part is to revert to its pre-New Deal biases that have nothing to do with economics and allocating coordinating right, coordination rights on the basis of ownership while cloaking this underlying preference as the influence of economic theory, which is really what the Chicago School did. Um, but in fact, the notion of competition does not support this allocation of rights now any more than freedom of contract did before the New Deal. So I was going to give a couple of examples very quickly. Um, so so as the New Deal order breaks down, the business model of certain gig economy firms has made this allocation of coordination rights very vivid by stretching its limits. That's because some such firms, such as Uber, expressly set the prices of commodities that they also purport not to sell, such as ride services. So they have actually drawn an antitrust lawsuit because of this. But And, and there's a discrepancy here because meanwhile, Uber drivers are, are currently not permitted to coordinate as to the exact same thing, the price of ride services. Even indirectly, Uber has stepped in and pressed this exact norm against collective bargaining rights for Uber drivers when Seattle, the city of Seattle, stepped in, uh, tried to step into the breach. But I want, actually want you to notice that the Uber's effects on the market in which it operates are indistinguishable from the effects that would be had by a cartel of drivers independently, right? And the other thing is that this, uh, this method of allocating coordination rights already characterizes the regulation of many firms outside the so-called gig economy. For example, in the trucking industry, firms that contract with truck drivers are permitted to engage in price coordination of, of, of those services that would be, again, denied to a cartel of individual truck drivers. Um, and I would say that this inconsistency characterizes the service sector more broadly anywhere we don't have actual coordination rights for workers, whether that's in the form of effective labor law or at least the permission to do so through antitrust. I'll stop there. Thank you so very much. So this leads nicely on, uh, on my question to Bill. So we've been talking about the organization of businesses in setting wages, <laughs> in a sense. And, and I obviously want to, to ask Bill, who's the expert on unions, about the organization of workers. We know that um, unions continue to have a very important presence in the economy. 
and in actually sustaining wages for working Americans. We know that for many years, actually, unions contributed to the decline in income inequality. But unfortunately, at least since the 1980s, we've seen a decline in unionization rates. Um, most recently, we saw just a few weeks ago that the Supreme Court struck down an Illinois law which uh, required uh, public sector workers to pay union fees even if they were non-union workers. And this, again, is another way to um, restrain the power of unions. So I want, I want you, Bill, to walk us through the key drivers of declining um, unionization over the past few decades, including some of the recent developments as well, and to explain to us how this affects the wages of workers across the economy and also different types of workers, actually. So thank you, and I'm not tweeting, I'm looking at my time. Um, <laughs> it's a timer. Uh, uh, thank you for the organizers, and thank you for including unions as part of the solution because they are. So the quick, short answer is, as you have heard, the increase in power of firms, the monopsony power, the response, some people would say, is, well, let's get rid of their power and let's have things that are more competitive. The other answer is, let's empower the workers to fight against the monopsony power. Now, another quick answer, we deregulated the airline industry. We said, oh, there's gonna be this wonderful competition. Workers should benefit because now we're making the firms not as powerful. And we know how that story ended. We ended up with three powerful airlines. And in the process, we weakened the collective bargaining of that industry. It has fought to keep unionized, but in the process had many losses mostly through their pension funds disappearing into thin air. So the answer to what do you do, let's make the product market more competitive, that doesn't necessarily mean that workers benefit. Why is a monopsony a problem? It's the opposite of a monopoly. So a monopoly means that in the market we get a higher price and less output. Monopsony we get a lower price, in this case for wages, and we get less demand, in this case for workers. So the way you get the monopsony closer to the competitive equilibrium is you give the workers the power to oppose what the monopsonist is doing and force the monopsonist to see the world from a competitive lens. That's what unions do. Recent research has made clear that as we have seen the increased concentration of markets and the increased concentration of labor markets, only, only in the case of where we have unions do we have an antidote against the downward pressure that we have documented to wages that results from that. So in the nutshell, that's the key. We have to have balance of power. Now there are a lot of reasons why this bleeds over because it's not uh, just a simple thing of um, the unions fighting against uh, monopsony power, unions have an important democratic role because it is the one place where workers come together, male, female, black, Latino, white, Asian, they're all together. And in that setting, it means that workers get to think about what are my economic interests and we see repeatedly that in those states that have higher union density, outcomes for working people are different. Look at the level of K-12 investment in education, the investment in the children of workers. In states that have high union density, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of dollars different between low union density states on what do they spend to educate children. Just a simple thing of investment in workers as they develop. It doesn't take place without workers' voice being part of the democratic process. This is why the taking the money out of public sector workers is a way of taking the power out of the union to have mobilization for democratic purposes with a small d. 
we all complain about mass incarceration. Ultimately, what capitalists have to do is have a credible threat. If you're not going to work for low wages, then I'm going to punish you. Now, there are many ways I can punish you, and you see that. Those states, if you become unemployed, you have a far less chance of getting unemployment insurance in those states with low union density than states with high union density. If you're a mother and you're trying to support your family instead of being recognized as a worker or a potential worker trying to support your family, TANF benefits in low union density states don't get you close to the poverty line. You have to look up to the ceiling to the poverty line. In high union density states, the benefits are far more uh, beneficial to getting you to poverty. So, and let's not even talk about Medicaid and access to health insurance. The states that are fighting against that are low union density states. And consequently, as you would imagine, you have a shorter lifespan if you live in a low union density state. It even affects your life. So whether I'm gonna lock you up, deny you health care, deny you education, and have you die younger, it matters to have the voice of unions in the political process. It matters because it affects state and local elections. National elections, people in Washington don't care about this sort of stuff. But at the local level, it does matter. Um, now, it does have its limits. We talked about macro policy. In Denver, where the unemployment rate now is below 3%, our building trades are in renegotiation right now for their contract. And despite the building boom in Denver, despite this unemployment rate below 3%, the response from the employers is, you don't get more than a 3% raise. So even with union power, we still have a problem that what the Fed has baked into the system, the expectation of employers is that wages only go up a certain amount. We don't care that you suffered wage losses. We don't care that you're behind. Uh, we're not gonna let you catch up. You're just gonna move forward like it's normal. So when we were talking about, oh, median incomes finally got back to 1999 levels, that's why you can't get back, because every time workers have been falling behind, these built-in expectations of firms is, you don't get to catch up for when you fell behind. Just going forward, you get to, do what was normal. And so unions are important for changing the political dialogue, but they're vital for the other dialogue. And, and finally, unions are important for transparency in the workplace. I'm at minus two minutes. So let, let me wrap up real fast. Um, unions are, are important uh, for, for the transparency that they put in the, work, in the workplace for wages. As a consequence, Wage gaps between men and women, between blacks and whites, are much smaller in the union sector than they are in the non-union sector. And a consequence of the breakdown of the labor market is it's not clear what the wages are. You heard Eileen talk about this. In a market, there should be a clearing wage for a given skill level. That doesn't exist. Transparency in our labor market does not exist. One way that unions function is to make clear about what the wages are. That's a way of lowering discrimination. And it's a way of empowering workers who otherwise don't have voice and don't have a way to, to raise wages. So it's very important for women and for people of color. And it's very important for making labor markets function. So non-union workers benefit because unionized firms, non-union firms understand what the wage needs to be. Thank you, Bill. So each of you has been talking about a specific cause behind low wages, behind stagnant wages, fissured workplaces. You talked about monitoring fiscal policy and the lack of full employment. Bill talked about declining unions. And Sanjukta talked about anti-competitive environments and how, how this actually reduces wages. But if you remember, the title of the panel was How Can America Be a High-Wage Society? So we want some answers. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you now to talk a little bit about potential policy solutions to these specific problems that we face and how can we make 
the situation in each of your areas better so uh, we can actually move forward or continue at least making the little progress we've been seeing in the, in the past two, three years. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so uh, just to pick up where Bill left off, I want to say that in addition to the direct effects of unionization, unions are very effective working in alliance with other labor organizations and with community organizations around a, a number of the victories that we've won, the increase in the minimum wage, pay family leave in the states that have it. Uh, I directed the Center for Women and Work when we got pay family leave in New Jersey. We could never have done it without the uh, uh, help of the many, many unions in the state that threw their weight behind uh, making this happen. <clears throat> so having said that, what I, I want to talk about the fact that in the part of the economy I'm looking at, uh, employer to employer, employer by employer solutions are not going to help these companies. Unions cannot come in and organize a laundry that has 20 workers uh, and really on a very small margin. So I'll talk to policies that can really make a difference. <clears throat> the first of them is establishing minimum employment standards. So not just a minimum wage, but a living wage, paid vacation, uh, paid sick days. These are things that employers can and should provide. They benefit all workers. They help the most vulnerable workers the most. Uh, we need to, uh, some federal policies that will help share the prosperity that workers have created. And in this category, I put things like paid family and medical leave that Senator Gillibrand was talking about, really important. Uh, affordable child care, uh, 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 tuition-free uh, college at the, at the public uh, colleges and universities, single payer health care. These are federal programs that would make it much more manageable uh, if you are stuck in a job in, uh, of the kind that we've been talking about. We need to hold remote entities accountable. This in the, I didn't get to give any examples in my talk because I ran out of time, but think about franchisors and franchisees. If there's a wage theft or something, they, they look at the franchisee. <coughs> when you look at nursing homes, even if they're part of a big chain owned by a private equity company, they're incorporated separately. They don't own the real estate that the home stands on. Your mother dies in one of them, go sue them. They have no resources. We need to establish joint employer laws that make it clear that you can't just get away with doing that. Uh, and then, um, I, I guess I'll stop there because I have many more, but <laughs> other people have them too, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I would say a couple things. One, um, just as a, I'll be specific in a second, but to set up the sort of the overall rubric, I mean, the way I interpret the last, whatever, three to four decades of really slow wage growth for the bottom 80% is that there was not one bill that passed in 1978, which was the Suppressed Wages Act, and we just need to reverse it. It's, but it was all about policy, and it was about every single day, sort of the right wing waking up and saying, what can we do to take a little more leverage and bargaining power away from the bottom 80% to allow an upward redistribution of income. And, so, and that's how it's gonna be fought yeah, back against. It's not gonna be, we're not gonna pass one bill that is the Restore Equality Act of 2020. It's we're gonna have people who wake up every single day and look at things like joint employer standard, who look at paid sick leave, who look at the minimum wage. And so I think it's great that we're getting specific like that, but we also need to realize there's not one big silver bullet. There's just waking up every day and trying to do little bits to restore power to workers again. Just as a plug, we just released something at EPI called First Day Fairness, which is 15 policies. It's basically rights that workers sign away without knowing it their first day on the job. They sign away their right to class action suits. About half of employers in this country give people a piece of paper their first day of work, and you cannot file a class action suit when you sign that paper. Supreme Court just said that's a perfectly fine thing to do in the Epic Systems decision. So there's so many things. That's why you need places like CEPR and EPI to, to you know, look at that every day. My one specific is we need Federal Reserve staffed with governors who do not underestimate the incredible value of genuine full employment. We actually had a period five years in the late 1990s where wage growth was pretty sustained and across the board. It's not a coincidence. It was when we actually allowed unemployment to sit really low for a really long time, even in the face of lots of mainstream economists going, no, 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 that's too low. That's going to spark inflation. Um, and so I think we really need to have Federal Reserve governors who make that part of the mandate, maximum employment, give it a much higher weight than they've tended to do over the past 30 to 40 years. Yeah, so 
the one thing I want to reemphasize is there's no one silver bullet. So in hopes that in 2020 we're talking to a different administration. Uh, don't come into office, and those of you on the Hill, don't think that you're going to have an easy job. Oh, I'm going to get the minimum wage up, and then I'm done. I, you know, hit the bullet. Uh, you're going to be exceedingly busy because you're going to have to pass all of this, not one of it, all of it, because it's going to take all of it. We have heard too much about, oh, our labor laws were, you know, they came up in the 1930s, this is the 21st century, we need 21st century laws, meaning, when many people say that, you don't need any. That's their form of modernization. And as Eileen laid out, no, it means we expect more. So just as we understood we needed labor standards in the 1930s, they have to be updated, not down, up. So increased productivity on the part of workers means that we must ensure that workers benefit and reflect that increase in productivity through things like paid leave and all the things that she mentioned. So this is not a silver bullet. Workers must come into the job with being in a union as a right, not as a fight. It's a right, not a fight. And currently, because of it being a fight, you have to fight to get your right. That can't be. When I show up, I am in a union. When I am voting on is not do I get a voice, it's do I want the UAW or the steel workers? That's what I'm supposed to be voting on. That's the vote. So we have to put the default, I am in a union, it is a right. Yeah, yeah. Trade legislation has to recognize that if you're going to make the world compete, there have to be rules for labor, not just rules that protect capital. Nowhere in any trade theory that any economist took was there this thing called an ISDS, right? There is nowhere an independent settlement dispute system in trade theory that says that corporations and corporations only get to assert that there are laws democratically passed by democracies that don't have to go through the court system of that country. This is the only area in which that takes place. African Americans have every right to argue, you cannot show me except in Texas where a white police officer has ever been convicted of shooting a black person unarmed, armed, or whatever. We don't get to go to the International Human Rights Court we have documents. We can show you tapes. But we cannot go to the U International Human Rights Court. Let some company say, oh, you raised the minimum wage in Canada. Oh, you passed an environmental law in Canada. The earth is going to end. I'm not going to the Canadian courts. I'm not going to the American courts. I get my own court. No. <laughs> so you're going to be real busy because you're going to have to fix trade so that humans are not in competition, just like capital isn't in competition against governments. So that's the other thing you got to change. And as we just heard, you got to work on the Federal Reserve System. You got to work on who are the economists who are advising the next president so that they actually believe that workers are supposed to get paid more money and believe in a vast agenda, not Oh, we're going to do health care, and we won't worry about the fact that you didn't raise the minimum wage. OK? There are only two people elected president, elected president since 1930 who did not raise the minimum wage. One of them was Ronald Reagan. You know who the other one was. That's shameful for a Democrat. That's shameful. This cannot be next time. Thank you. So to pick up on this point that it's not one silver bullet, um, and we have to do a lot, but I think as well, I think that the main sort of suggestion I want to leave folks with today is that we have to work on our rubrics uh, for what 
all that stuff we're gonna do is. Um, the right wing didn't just sort of, they woke up every day and you know worked on this, but they had a great rubric that was coordinated from you know the ivory tower on down. And we have to fight that as well, as well as having the specific policy fight. So um, I have, I think, a specific and a general suggestion. I think that this, so, so the reason fundamentally I'm interested in this antitrust labor intersection is I think it's important in terms of fissuring and in terms of the contemporary economy because it, because it addresses the issue of um, whether it's through a union or something else, economic coordination rights for working people at its root. But I'm actually interested in it because I think it's the place where the right wing most clearly crystallized in the positive law, this ideology. And that ideology is, or that method, that sort of sort of ideational method, whatever we want to call it, is the again, the selective deployment of this pro-competition anti-coordination norm. It's a selective deployment because we always have economic coordination, but we don't say that. We just say it's about promoting competition and we make it invisible, the forms of coordination that exist in the economy that are coordinated by the already wealthy and the already powerful. And this happens in more than one way, but it happens in a very, very clear way in the biases in antitrust law. So I would say specifically in antitrust law, it's important to, um, to make those changes because I do think it radiates outward. Um, but but so, so specifically within antitrust law, we've heard a lot recently um, about widening the consumer welfare standard. Um, that was not the legislative intent behind the act. Nowhere in the act does it, in the Sherman Act, does it say consumer welfare. Nowhere does it say competition, actually. Um, the leg I mean, read the legislative record. They talk about worker welfare. They talk about producer welfare. So it's very clear that it's supposed to be all these stakeholders in society. There's a, you know, an anti-monopoly movement that's uh, you know, afoot now. I think it's worth supporting that. Uh, for that reason, I don't think we should think that combating monopolies is the solution to all our problems, but I think that it's really important to change that legal standard, and I would say specifically to eliminate within antitrust this blanket rule against coordination beyond firm boundaries, which specifically holds down workers who are beyond the bounds of employment, which the legal the, the legal relationship of, of employment is what in the New Deal we decided was going to be the criterion for engaging in coordination rights for workers. That's what you had to do to qualify for the NLRA and be able to be in a union, but there's no reason it has to be that way. They didn't necessarily anticipate that firms were gonna react in this way at the time. But, but then on the more general point, I would suggest that as we, as we approach every one of these little policy fights, um, that we keep in mind that this, what I've been talking about, this selective deployment of this idea of competition, it, it, it's a crystallization of something that exists beyond it and is more deep-seated. We see it in legislative deliberation. We saw it in the deregulation debates of the late 70s and the early 80s. Uh, we see it everywhere that the law is unsettled and decision makers step in and take a position. The FTC filed an amicus brief in the Seattle case. That wasn't settled law about the reach of the state action exemption. They were acting on something deeper because this indoctrination project has been very successful. People see and demand competition between workers and the less powerful and don't seem to demand it among the wealthy and the powerful. Um, and finally, we also see it in uh, judicial deliberation and in policy debate more, more broadly. So my suggestion today is less for a specific policy, although I said what I think the specific, sort of on my piece what the specific policies would be, but more for how we should approach discussion and deliberation about it. We ought not be defensive about advocating economic coordination through public democratic means, whether that's legislation on living wages or legislation on regulated competition or regulation on, on uh, collective bargaining rights. Nor should we be defensive about promoting associations of workers and small producers. We should we should proactively champion the fairer, more just, and the more ecologically sustainable allocation of economic coordination rights. Thank you for all your comments. So I'm very glad that several of you brought up some, some other factors that have certainly been examined as, as being behind the, the rising inequality, including minimum wages, trade, right? I mean, there, other factors that economists have usually looked at as important determinants of the rising inequality. 
Another factor which certainly was m mentioned in passing was the role of tax policy and transfers. So I have a couple of uh, questions, and one of them is actually a very good question. So it says, has the president's tax bill changed prospects for wages, right? Because it's true, you said, right? There is not one policy, but certainly this recent tax policy that was passed, we, we expect will have some important implications for take home pay. So I, I want all of you to comment, by the way, on this question. So yeah, I, I think one, one sign that there's been some progress made, at least in people realizing the depth of the American wage crisis, is that everyone has to hide behind the claim that my policy will raise wages when they put forward. And you saw that really clearly in the debate over the tax change um, done at the end of 2017. Basically, the Trump administration, the main way they sold their tax plan was, uh, was it $4,000 per worker in, in higher wages? Um, and it's, you know, it's a really implausible claim. I mean, basically, the centerpiece of the plan was a really large cut in the corporate tax rate and through a whole series of reasonings that, you know, some economic textbooks will tell you is possible. Lower corporate tax rate was supposed to increase the incentive to invest in plant and equipment. It's also supposed to lead to the savings to finance it is sort of as the return to savings was higher for households, they were going to save more. That was going to raise productivity because workers are going to have more capital to work with, more productivity, higher wages. And so every link of that chain has to work in order for people to actually see that $4,000 in extra wages. And, and pretty much every link is broken. I mean, basically, the claim that firms are not investing enough in recent years because their profit rate was too low, after tax after tax profit rates have just been historically high all throughout the recovery since the Great Recession. Investment has been very weak. Like if you're looking for what is the thing to change to make more investment happen, that seems really bizarre to look at that unless that's not your goal, unless your goal is to shove more money into the hands of, of shareholders. So I think on the one hand, it's a bit of a victory in that like the terrain has shifted to who can do more to boost wages. On the other hand, that specific policy fight was a terrible loss because that will do nothing to boost wages. That will do a lot to increase inequality and the resulting deficit are just going to be leveraged politically for people to turn around and go, oh, look, all of a sudden we have large deficits that require we cut lots of programs that are of crucial benefit to, to working families. So, you know, I think the policy outcome was a disaster. I'm slightly encouraged that at least people have to fight on the terrain of what's good for wages. I would say we're seeing the direct result in the attack on workers from the tax cut and now the Republican justification being well, we can't afford to assist workers. So if you want access to health insurance, then you need to be working. If you need food assistance, you need to be working. Constantly, we have adopted, and we heard from the opening remarks for our panel, this attitude that whatever we give to business is OK. Let a mother be struggling to put food on the table for her children then the lectures start, the head shaking, the finger pointing. You need to be more responsible. If I'm going to give you something, then you must do this, this, and this. We gave corporations billions of dollars, billions of dollars, and what did we ask? Did you have to raise wages? Did you have to increase hiring Americans? Did you have to show us actual capital investment in capital, not stock buybacks? We just said, here's a billion dollars. Have fun. <laughs> to the mother, we say, oh, you want $5 in food. Oh, my goodness. The whole earth is going to stop. Mm -hmm. It's human sacrifice. If we look at these ancient cultures that were, seemed to be very advanced, and we said, how could they be so advanced, but they would sacrifice humans because they thought that sacrificing this human was going to save the earth. But when you say to a corporation, I'm going to give you billions of dollars, but I say to a mother, you can't get $5 of food. You can't get access to health care for your children. I'm sacrificing you and your children. That's human sacrifice. So... The tax bill is leading to more of that language, and it's leading to a new avenue to attack workers who are being impoverished by this tax cut that was supposed to give us more wages. I'll close by saying my answer to them when they say they were going to give us $4,000 in wages from this tax cut 
why don't we cut to the chase, give us the $4,000, and then we'll benefit you. Let's do it the other way. So I don't have a major comment on this. The one thing that I would I would maybe just add is that once again, there's sort of an underlying legal structure that's more contingent than we start to sometimes assume that it is that's grounding this policy debate. So you know, the shareholder primacy norm wasn't always as strong as it is now, and stock buybacks weren't as big as they are now and have been in recent decades. And so there have been some proposals on the table to reform corporate law uh, to make uh, stock buybacks much more difficult um, and that would be you know another way to remove the incentive for, for this kind of plan so uh, these have all been great comments I have a slightly different thing that I want to talk about in, in relation to this and I'm especially talking to the Democrats in this room and if we have any Hill staffers uh, to them as well uh, and that is the idea which the Republicans would put forward as Bill has said that we cannot afford these policies because we don't have any money. Tax revenues do not pay, are not the limit, let me put it that way, tax revenues are not the limit on what we can do. What kinds of programs we can have, what kinds of policies we can have. I'm very concerned that the Democrats are talking about if they get power in the House, bringing back the PAYGO rules. PAYGO rules mean you can't pass a program unless you either raise taxes to pay for it or you cut some other services. This is a losing proposition for the American people, not to mention the political situation. Uh, the limit on what we can do is the resources we have in the country. As long as there are unemployed workers, unemployed uh, equipment, unemployed uh, resources, natural resources, we can do anything that our policymakers uh, want to uh, see happen. Uh, and this is what we have to understand. The, we will know when we are at that limit when we see inflation. And at that point, if we want to say, okay, we have too much demand, demand is outstripping supply, we don't cut back the programs. We raise the taxes on the people who got the big tax breaks now. We raise taxes not to pay for programs, but in order to bring demand in line with supply so that we can continue to do, do the things that we want to do. The Republicans clearly understand this. They never talk about how they're going to pay for things. We're a country with our sovereign, uh, sovereign uh, uh, control over uh, our money supply. We can always print money. We will never run out of money. Money is not the problem. It's only resources that we know how to, how to uh, deal with that problem. Thank you so much. So um, Bill talked about these uh, work requirements that are now being imposed uh, to get many cash transfers, right, for Medicaid, for some, for other benefits. And unfortunately, some of these are being imposed at the state level. But there is a, a great question here that I got that says, we haven't talked much about the state level solutions because the states could be part of the solution, not only part of the problem. And the question says, do you think there are state-level solutions that could get around some of the political gridlock, and in particular, even some of the political gridlock that, that Josh has been mentioning and alluding to? Well, definitely, yes. I mean, we see this in the paid sick days. We see this in paid family leave. We now have six states in the District of Columbia in which you are guaranteed paid family and medical leave. If you have a baby, you get maternity leave. If you want to bond with the child afterwards, if you're the non-birth parent, uh, you have a right to paid leave. Uh, get rid of that situation that Obama talked about where you have not even one day uh, to recover. And a situation in this country in which an unconscionable number of women return to work just two weeks after giving birth. And for every woman in this room who's had a child, you know exactly how difficult that would be. So the states have, they definitely can set a standard, they can show the way, uh, and there are many of these policies that they can, in fact, both as far as the employment standards are concerned and as far as uh, social, pro social uh, policies and programs that benefit all workers and mean the most to the most vulnerable. Uh, but it's not, it's not a complete solution. I mean, so we have six states in the District of Columbia. <laughs> Your, your right to paid leave should not depend on where you work, which state you work in. It should be your right as a citizen of this country, as it is in every other country. Uh, there's only 
I forget which is the one that doesn't have it besides us. Um, I thought it used to be Lesotho, but I think they passed two weeks paid maternity leave, so they wouldn't be they wouldn't be in the same basket with the United States. <laughs> so, I know it's I know of the countries in the United Nations, it's just us and one very less developed country that don't have these kinds of policies. Uh, experiments at the state level can be good, but they do not need to be the fetish. They tend to be on the left. Remember Mississippi, Arkansas, South Carolina? We never hold the bad examples, and we need to remember the bad examples. We thought Michigan would be protected forever, but as long as you have right to work states, states with no minimum wage, states that abuse workers, the decline in union density in the auto industry is because I can put my German factory in South Carolina. I can put my Japanese factory in Alabama. So don't make a fetish out of the ability that high union density states can deliver good ideas and good policy solutions that you can point to and say, the earth didn't fall when California decided to implement these, the, the California economy did not collapse. So it's good for that purpose, but that purpose only. They are not sustainable. The advances of any state is not sustainable as long as you are going to let other states remain Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And if we have to kick and drag Mississippi to the 21st century, then let's kick and drag Mississippi to the 21st century. So I, th I think that's right. And the other thing I would add is that even in some of those states where we are able to do experiments, that federal law often comes in and makes it much more difficult. And so again, this was an example when Seattle uh, passed collective bargaining rights for Uber drivers and the Chamber of Commerce sued under federal preemption, under federal antitrust law. And there's other examples of this um, under federal trucking deregulation, undermining uh, state minimum wage laws or classification laws um, for Massachusetts, an example, for truck drivers to address fissuring. Um, so unfortunately, I think there's no way out of having, the, you know, deconstructing, like it, in both of those cases, uh, federal preemption under federal trucking deregulation and federal aviation regulation um, and under antitrust, it's these same ideas of this like sort of selective deployment of the competition ideal against workers. And so I, I, to, to me, there's no way out of contesting that um, generally at the, at the state and the federal level. Just really quickly, I, th I think I agree with all this. I would say, on the one hand, there's a ton that states can do to raise standards, like California is having truly ambitious minimum wages. It's gonna be like 40 million people covered by that. The things they can't do, like really the, the fight for full employment is really a national fight. There's no state level Federal Reserve Board that can change interest rates in each state. And states are much more constrained in how much they can deficit spend than the federal government. They do not control their own currency. And so we do need, in the end, to win fights at the federal level as well. But like I said, there's a fight a day to, to win in pick. So there is a lot of room at the state level in the short term. So I have a follow-up question, actually. Um, on basis of something that Bill um, brought up. So you brought up the issue of the race to the bottom in tax policy. And so the, the question is, what's the best way out of this race to the bottom type situation? Well, one is having meaningful reform of our federal labor standards law so that we put in a real meaningful floor we should know that there are people in this country who are not interested in government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We fought a civil war against them, which is why Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address was talking to those states about government of the people, by the people, and for the people. We know which states he was talking to. He is still talking to them. So that's one way to prevent the race to the bottom. We have to understand that in a far more diverse population and the workforce is going to reflect the diversity ahead of the general population shift because the Latino and African American population is, is younger than the white population. So the switch over among working people is gonna be much faster. That a large part of inequality 
are continued racial inequalities. A large part of inequalities are continued gender inequalities. So when you look at inequality writ large, you can decompose it and you're going to see big chunks of overall inequality because of race and because of gender. And as the workforce changes the weight that you have to assign to that inequality is going to get bigger. It's just the arithmetic of it. So we have to get serious with federal standards because we also know that there are certain states, either we got them from the Mexican War or we got them from beating the Confederacy. But those, those states, the map is still the same, hate certain people. And they haven't changed their patterns. So, so we have to make sure that federal standards give us the tools to fight gender and racial discrimination because you can't solve worker inequality without solving those. It's just the arithmetic. So even if you don't care about it, you can't solve it because you can't get the inequality down without addressing those as well. And federal standards are necessary uh, to address that. So we, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, I, I definitely agree with Bill, and that was the reason looking at this fissured economy and asking what can actually be done. It is the federal standards having to do with uh, uh, minimum employment standards, which are the responsibility of companies, things like paid vacations, paid sick days, uh, living wages. If you, if you set a national wage that is something people can actually live on, then all of the companies that bid have that as what they have to pay their workers. And so the, you're not going to be underbid by somebody who's going to pay their workers even less. It's just, it, it will ha have a huge effect on the race to the bottom. And the other piece of it is our uh, federal uh, social programs uh, around child care, around uh, paid family and medical leave, around free college, and around uh, universal health care. Those, those things will make a huge difference in heading off the race to the bottom. Uh, and in making sure that resources are allocated in ways that benefit working families. Excellent. So unless Josh or Sanjukta want to comment, I want to really thank our panelists. I think it's been an excellent panel, not only in terms of identifying the causes behind low wages and why we have had this rising inequality of them over the last many decades, but also in terms of identifying solutions. So I want to really thank our panelists and please join me in thanking them. <laughs>